Hello, everyone, and welcome to part six of this long form lecture slash discussion series on Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Whether you're listening to this now or at some point in the future, uh, I hope you're doing well and I hope you enjoy the content that I'll be putting out today. Um, welcome specifically to uh, Al, Al the Cow, it looks like, um, who's uh, particularly watching right now, so thank you. Um, again, whether you're watching this in the future or whether you're watching this now. Uh, my hope in this series is to um, explain to a greater degree than uh, any other YouTube video that exists currently, or any series of YouTube videos that exist, um, what it is that Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance means and why exactly it is that is so important. I find it to be an incredibly um, important and profound book, but sometimes, um, even though I consider it to be a very accessible philosophy book, perhaps those ideas and the importance of those ideas is not, you know, always totally accessible. So my hope is that by um, speaking from a lot of the notes and thoughts that I have prepared on this, and then also interacting with you in the chat and discussing it, uh, that we'll be able to get to a better understanding than um, would otherwise be possible. Um, if you're new to the channel, I encourage you to check out some of our other videos. And if you're not, well, you know, it's always good to have you here too, for sure. Um, so what I want to talk about today, and we're starting to move into the portion of the book that I personally find quite a bit more interesting. Let me just adjust that real fast and see if I can get that green screen thing to go away. Um, Perhaps not. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about specifically today is um, Phaedrus's experiences at the university and what came after. He had some very unique experiences at the university. Again, he was a very unique individual with a, um, a, an extraordinarily high Q. He was admitted to the university to study biochemistry um, at the age of 16, I believe. And then a couple of years later, he actually flunked out um, due to uh, the official reasons were inattention to studies and failing grades. And after that, he began what he calls a lateral drift, which is um, a period of his life where he just kind of um, went around and did different things and didn't quite understand what it was that he was looking for. Um, so today, what I'm hoping to do is to explain what the cause of that, um, what the cause of that hang up was, what the real cause of him flunking out of the university was, and then to uh, um, go on and talk a little bit about the lateral drifts that eventually took him on a long path that returned him to the door of the university. And the crux of all this is going to be the nature of, the, of hypotheses. So let's back up just a little bit and talk about all the things we've talked about so far um, up until now, right? So we've talked, um, you know, the, a couple salient points that come forward. We've talked a little bit about the nature of scientific knowledge, right? We've talked a little bit about how um, the law of gravity, um, it, you know, in, in some sense is, is, it's not correct to say that the law of gravity is, is real or is reality. It's more correct to say that the law of gravity is a description of reality and that uh, these various descriptions can change over time, and they do in fact change over time. And although they are um, describing some, some underlying something, right? I mean, clearly there's something that is attracting matter to each other. Um, different explanations of that can certainly differ. They can, um, you know, differ from, uh, say, Newton's model, which is something like, uh, you know, things fall down, right? They, they're attracted towards the earth. Right. And you could also devise a more sophisticated representation of what's going on, a more sophisticated model, which is, well, really, you know, the apple is is sort of drawing the earth towards it just as much as the earth is drawing the apple towards it. It's just that it's to a much lesser degree because of their varying masses. But all massive objects, all objects that have mass will uh, attract each other. Right. Or you could also take the Einsteinian explanation, which is that uh, you have sort of a space time blanket or like a space time trampoline and that uh, massive objects like the sun or like the earth. Um, create a depression in that sort of space-time fabric, and that that depression uh, causes the effect that we call gravity, right? And I went through the same thing with atoms, right? That there's various explanations of what an atom is, um, and all of them to one degree or another uh, concord with the data. They all fit the data to one degree or another, and as we continue um, the process of scientific investigation, we come up with uh, new models that explain the data. And these, these models that explain the data are fundamentally what we what Pearson calls classical understanding, right? You can think of classical understanding or classical uh, representations of the world as, as, as maps of the world, right? Um, that's a very, very close analog in the same way that a map is not itself the territory that it represents, but it does, you know, represent the territory. It presents kind of like the scale model of the territory in the same way um, classical understanding examines things and, uh, you know, divides them into parts and interrelates the parts. And that's also the mode of understanding that is employed, um, you know, typically when we uh, use uh, technology and science um, seem particularly emblematic of that. We also talked about how classical versus romantic understandings can be reflected in a variety of fields. Um, you know, for instance, in the field of art, there are artists who produce art in sort of this uh, uh, romantic way. And then there are critics who, you know, who, who criticize and evaluate the art. 
in sort of this classic way. They comment on it. And this can actually create quite a few different um, splits in different fields, right? Um, in my own, well, one of the fields that I have experience in in, um, in English, in my graduate program, there there's two divisions in the program. One division uh, called the Master of Fine Arts program, and that's for people who want to write essays, write poetry, write fiction. And then there was the Master of Arts degree, and what that is intended for is it's, it's not intended to help you write those things. Instead, it's, help, it's intended to help you evaluate and criticize those things, to map them, to find all the parts, and to interrelate the parts. So that's classical understanding and romantic understanding in a nutshell. So Piercig, um, um, Piercig is, uh, you know, he, he's a, this is him, he's 16 years old, right, which is quite young to be entering a university st to study biochemistry. It's quite young to be entering a university to study anything. Um, and that's the situation that he's in, is he's going to investigate um, this, this classic knowledge, specifically um, the structure of classic knowledge that we know as the scientific method, which we reviewed briefly in the last lecture, right, and which you're all familiar with from middle school science projects and high school sci science projects. Um, namely that, uh, you know, you have need to have some kind of problem or question, and then you have hypotheses that might be a potential answer to that problem or question, and then uh, you'll rigorously test those hypotheses uh, and derive conclusions. So that's the scientific method. Um, briefly, David Murray says, Hi, Joseph from Ireland. Um, love you and other Joseph's ideas. You guys have a different way of seeing things. Makes me feel smarter when I watch you guys. Love the Ryan Wright threshing videos. Keep them coming. Um, hey, thank you very much. Um, we certainly enjoy producing the content we do, and we're trying hard to um, produce more and better content as we go, and we appreciate um, the support. You know, whether that's watching the video, subscribing, um, donating, or using our Amazon affiliate links, we always um, appreciate that. So thank you very much, David. I'm glad you appreciate it, and I hope, um, I, you know, I hope, I, I, I hope that as producing these videos, that it makes me smarter, and I hope that it makes you smarter and better too. Um, that's the whole purpose of this, right? Are we teaching quality? Are we learning quality? We certainly hope so. So. Um, Phaedrus's hang up at the university comes from hypotheses. And what Piercig says as he writes this book is he says, um, we're at, I believe, the beginning of chapter 10 now. Piercig says, the formation of hypotheses is the most mysterious of all the categories of the scientific method because it's not really clear where hypotheses come from. It's just an idea that pops into your head. It's a possible solution or explanation that uh, just seems to um, you know, pop into your head. And he emphasizes, you know, just because an idea pops into your head doesn't make it scientific truth. It's not scientific truth until it's tested. Um, he also quotes Albert Einstein in conjunction with this, and I'm going to read part of the quote um, because it's remarkable. And by the way, I want to comment um, that uh, if you have a solid background in the hard sciences, I'm particularly interested in your perspective as uh, you look at all of this. And the reason for that is because my background in the hard sciences is yeah, is, is pretty lacking. At, uh, you know, Phaedrus entered the university at age 16 to study biochemistry, I believe at age 16 or around there, um, I was bombing my AP biology test. Um, so that's a clear difference between myself and Phaedrus in case there weren't enough already. Um, so I'm interested, particularly in the perspective of those who um, have more of a formal science background like Phaedrus and whether or not their experience in the laboratory uh, is in accordance with Phaedrus's experience in the laboratory. Okay. So this is um, a quote from Einstein about um, scientific inquiry. And what he says is, man tries to make for himself, in the fashion that suits him best, a simplified and intelligible picture of the world. Again, this is the classical understanding, right? This is the sorting of the, the sand that, that surrounds us, the sorting of all the things and phenomena that surround us. This is the map of the territory. He then tries to some extent to substitute this cosmos of his for the world of experience and thus to overcome it. He makes this cosmos and its construction the pivot of his emotional life in order to find in this way the peace and serenity which he cannot find in their narrow whirlpool of personal experience. The supreme task is to arrive at those universal elementary laws from which the cosmos can be built up by pure deduction. He says there is no logical path to these laws, only intuition, resting on sympathetic understanding and experience can reach them. And Piercing, the author, comments, this is a strange way to talk about science, because when we think about science, we typically think about, um, you know, sort of a very hard-headed approach to the world, you know, very evidence-based, you know, uh, grounded in experimentation, you know, coldly logical and rational, uh, very distant from the world um, of emotion and affect um, and, you know, personal experience and, um, so to speak, subjective viewpoints that seem more associated with the romantic view. Science is, at least hypothetically, at least, you know, for most of us, we think of it as, an, as a very rational, uh, classic enterprise. And here Einstein is saying, well, 
you know, there, there seems to be a, what he says is an intuitive or a sympathetic understanding that guides the, that guides scientific inquiry. And it's precisely this that Phaedrus gets hung up on. He gets hung up on the nature of hypotheses and what it is that they come from. And he shoots down two possibilities. One thing you might say is, well, where do these hypotheses come from? Um, you might say, well, they come from the scientific method. And what Piercig says, what Piercig the narrator says is, well, that can't quite be correct because you generate the hypotheses and then you test them with the scientific method. It can't be that the scientific method just generates the hypotheses uh, because it comes after the hypotheses. You first, you need a hypothesis and then you can test that hypothesis. And another possible explanation is you could say, well, you could say that the hypotheses are supplied by, uh, they're supplied by nature, they're supplied by the environment, they're, su they're supplied by the material universe around us. And uh, in other words, there's sort of this, this objective something that is out there existing in the world that you then, you know, discover in the same way that you could discover America, uh, you know, or discover the moon. Um, and Piercing says, well, this isn't a very sufficient explanation either. These hypotheses can't come from nature because what nature supplies is it supplies experimental data to test the hypotheses, right? It doesn't uh, supply the hypothesis itself. The hypothesis um, comes into your mind before you're, uh, you know, it, it, it's not in the data itself precisely. Instead, it's tested against the data, which suggests that they're two different things. This is very similar to what we talked about um, a few videos ago when we talked about the law of gravity. And the question is, did Isaac Newton discover the law of gravity? And the answer that Piercy gave us at that time was, no, he didn't discover the law of gravity. It's much more correct to say that he invented it. And the reason why it's more correct to say that is because, um, or the reason why it's not correct to say that he discovered um, gravity is because if you discovered gravity, then you have to believe that gravity, uh, you know, was sort of out there in the universe to, um, that it existed previously, ready for him to discover in the same way that, you know, um, you know, presumably there's galaxies that we'll someday discover. And he says that can't quite be uh, because it clearly doesn't have matter. It doesn't have mass or energy, the law of gravity. Uh, and so it must exist only in people's minds, right? Um, you know, there are other um, ideas that exist in people's minds or else there's things in the physical universe that have mass or energy. It clearly doesn't have mass or energy, so it has to be a mental phenomena. Um, but if it's a mental phenomena, then, you know, it clearly didn't exist before Isaac Newton because it wasn't in anybody's mind. And so if you believe that the law of gravity existed, um, then you have to believe in something that isn't mind and isn't matter um, because there was no mind contemplating it prior to Newton and there was no matter, obviously. Like, nobody would contend that the law of gravity has mass or energy. It just it just doesn't. And so the uh, the contention that Piercy gives us is that Isaac Newton discover, or excuse me, he doesn't discover the law of gravity. Instead, he invents the law of gravity. He invents a map. He invents a description um, to describe the experimental data that he's experiencing, right? And so Piercig is saying here, is saying the same thing about hypotheses. You don't discover hypotheses. They're not just out there sitting in the universe precisely. That, that doesn't seem like the right way to think about it. Um, instead, they're, they're, they're coming from somewhere, and it's not in the experimental data that nature gives us. Okay, so another explanation is you could say, well, the hypothesis, you know, is uh, just in your own mind, right? It's just something that you come up with, and it doesn't have any uh, relationship with the outside world of mass and energy um, and atoms and physical, physical stuff. And um, Einstein doesn't agree with that, and Piercig agrees with Einstein that it's the incorrect explanation. What Einstein says is, um, Einstein says, nobody who has really gone into the matter will deny that, and I'm going to explain this quote after because it's a little confusing. Nobody, he said, who has really gone into the matter will deny that in practice, the world of phenomena uniquely determines the theoretical system, in spite of the fact that there is no theoretical bridge between phenomena and their theoretical principles. Okay, so he says, in practice, the world of phenomena uniquely determines the theoretical system. In other words, you know, whatever it is that's out there in the world that we're studying when we do science, you know, or maybe when we do any kind of inquiry, but when we do science, you know, when we investigate the physical universe around us, um, there's some kind of connection between the phenomena we experience and the theoretical system that we um, devise to describe and understand that phenomena. And, and this seems really clear, right? Uh, you know, um, you know, uh, let's 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 take an example. Oh yeah, so you can't possibly land on the moon unless Newtonian mechanics is correct, right? The moon, it actually turns out, is is quite a long distance away, and it's quite difficult to hit. You know, the Earth is hurtling through space at a terrific speed. The moon is hurtling through space at a terrific speed. And the idea that you could just you know randomly shoot um, a, uh, shoot a rocket to the moon is, is it's just silly. It's it's incredibly improbable. But we actually did manage to do this, and the reason why is because we have this sort of this theoretical framework 
right, called Newtonian mechanics, right, laws of physics, so on and so forth. And it actually must have some relationship with the with the real, you know, quote unquote objective world around us. There must be some relationship there because it works. If it had no relationship at all, then any system would be perfectly acceptable. Um, and, and it seems very clear that that's not true because it's actually quite hard to hit the moon with a rocket. Um, and yet very possible, and yet very possible. And the reason why is because there's there's some kind of bridge between the theory and the actual fact, right? So it can't just be that the theory is, you know, is only something that you make up subjectively in your mind that has no relationship with the outside world. Um, right, And but Einstein says it's not clear what the relationship is because um, remember, the theory is not something that we can go discover in the world. We can't go, uh, you know, dig into the mountains and find little crystals of theory there. Instead, what it seems like is that we can go into the mountain and dig around and find experimental data, or we can go into space and find experimental data, and we can run different experiments with rockets and find experimental data. Um, but that experimental data isn't the theory that we use to understand the experimental data. It's, it's, just, it's just data, right? It's just puzzle pieces, right? And we can arrange those puzzle pieces in different ways, and some of those ways seem to work better than others. Um, you know, clearly, so it's not purely subjective, but it, it simply can't be objective either. Otherwise, you know, again, again, you know, the laws of physics would have mass or energy or something. We'd be able to, you know, find them in some way. They'd be part of the data we pull in, um, the experimental data we pull in. Okay, so there's a conundrum here, right? Because, you know, the hypotheses don't come from the scientific method, right? And they don't come from the experimental data. And they don't come from the scientist himself or herself, right? And so... The question that Phaedrus gets hung up on is, okay, these hypotheses are totally central to scientific activity. You cannot use the scientific method until you have a hypothesis because what the scientific method does is test hypotheses. They're absolutely central. They're absolutely core. They're absolutely essential. They're, you know, in some sense, what kicks the whole process of science off. And yet science doesn't seem to have any account of where these hypotheses come from. It doesn't seem to have any account of the origin of these hypotheses or what it is that they're grounded in or what it is that they're based on or perhaps even what they are. And this is what Phaedrus gets hung up on. And to his fellow scientists at the university, you know, uh, presumably, you know, he had advisors and professors and fellow students, and uh, they were not at all impressed by this and they didn't really understand it at all. And they, um, their, their response fundamentally was, well, but we know that the scientific method works, right? Like, you know, we did the thing, we put people on the moon. Uh, this thing is clearly functional. I guess at this point uh, in the proceedings, you know, this would have been when Phaedrus was 16 years old, and I, I, I can't do the, all the date calculations right now, but it would have been prior to 1969, um, which is, if I remember correctly, when uh, Apollo 11 um, landed on the moon. So, um, you know, they couldn't have said, um, you know, they landed on the moon because they hadn't landed on the moon, obviously, but they could, you know, point to the, you know, the plethora of uh, technological innovations that um, existed in the world around them and say, hey, look, you know, the scientific method works. Like, we're clearly making stuff that works. And so, you know, what's the problem? Where's the question? You know, uh, why are you asking about hypotheses when we know that this thing works? And the reason why is, um, the reason that Phaedrus gives is that Phaedrus um, was in science, or the reason that Pearson gives is that Phaedrus was not in science for, say, personal reasons, um, not for reasons of self-aggrandizement, and not for reasons of uh, personal superiority, but instead, um, you know, for, let's say, um, very authentic and personal and devoted reasons, the way that he describes it, um, using the quote from Einstein, is that the state of mind which enables a man to do this kind of scientific work is akin to that of a religious worshiper or lover. The daily effort comes from no deliberate intention or program, but straight from his heart. The way that Piercy describes it is he says that, um, Phaedrus didn't see it as a career for his own personal advancement, um, but instead as a kind of noble, noble idealistic goal. And for this reason, you know, he became very curious about where hypotheses come from. A way that you could think about it is that, um, you know, you and I most of the time don't ask how our refrigerator works, right? It is enough for us that the refrigerator works. We're not interested in sort of, you know, prying under the surface to figure out uh, the, the underlying mechanisms and systems instead it's just enough for us to to use the effects of it right to take advantage of the fact that it does work right or similarly with a car you know you and I uh, don't think very much about how a car works right and we also don't think very much about the supply chain uh, you know assuming that you have an internal combustion engine vehicle we don't think very much about the supply chain that brings that you know takes petroleum out of the ground um refines it and then delivers it to your gas station in terms of gasoline. You know, we just pull up to the gas station, you know, you put gasoline in and you're done. Uh, 
right? So we don't think about those sort of underlying issues very much because it just works. It would be, it wouldn't make any sense um, for us to be thinking about that because all we want to do is to use the car to go places. So Phaedrus's associates at the university are like those people who are just using the car to get places. They're just using the scientific method to get places and do things. And so to them, it's like, well, you know, the car's running, like, so does it matter whether it's electrical or whether it's gasoline powered? Does it, you know, does the underlying mechanism fundamentally matter as long as it works? And Phaedrus's answer is yes, because he's intellectually curious about this, right? He wants to know what it is that the scientific method is built on. But for, um, but for his associates in, in the university, uh, it fundamentally does not matter. And so he becomes hung up on this question of where scientific method comes from. And so he explores that and analyzes that. And the interesting thing is that, you know, um, you can't use a refrigerator and uh, study it at the same time, right? You know, in order to study it, in order to take apart, take it apart and understand the underlying mechanisms, you know, you'll have to unplug it. You know, you'll have to, uh, you know, pull it away from the wall. You'll probably want to take all the food out because it's going to go bad because it's no longer cold inside. And you might disassemble portions of it in order to understand what's going on. And so there's sort of this inconsistency here where Phaedrus can't use the scientific method to, you know, practice biochemistry and at the same time have the sort of philosophic examination of what the scientific method is and where it comes from and what it all means. And so because of that, um, he gets hung up on that. He gets kicked out of the university. He's expelled. And uh, the way that Piercy describes this is that it's a pretty stunning event for him. I believe what he says is... Um, in a stunned state, Phaedrus began a long series of lateral drifts that led him into a far orbit of the mind, but he eventually returned along a route that we are now following to the doors of the university itself. And he, Piercing says, you know, tomorrow, in the next chapter, he'll try to start on that route. So what comes out of this, what comes out of his expulsion from the university is this long series of sort of lateral drifts where he kind of wanders aimlessly through life and uh, has a variety of different experiences. Uh, before I go into that, and I do want to go into that today, um, I want to talk a little bit more about why it would be important to look at these, um, to, to examine hypotheses, you know, because one thing you could say is you could look at Phaedrus, that student, and say, you know, the refrigerator works, the car works. Let's not get hung up on that sort of, you know, abstract foo-foo theory kind of thing because we know it works and so it works and so let's not ask too many questions let's make good practical use of it right you know it's almost as though phaedrus um you know uh, uh, again wants to break apart the refrigerator or break apart the car to understand it and everyone else is saying if you break apart the car we won't have a car we won't be able to get places we won't be able to go where we want to go um, so I think Phaedrus's view that, you know, that it is worthwhile to examine hypotheses as an entity in themselves deserves a little bit of defense. And that defense is supplied by Piercig. So I want to go into that a little bit before talking about the lateral dress. So the way that Phaedrus explains his experience is he says that um, he noticed again and again in his, in his lab work that what might seem to be the hardest part of scientific work, which is thinking up the hypotheses, was invariably the easiest. How he describes it is that he just formally how he describes it is that he would just formally write down everything precisely and clearly, and then hypotheses would pop into his mind. And he says, as I was as he's testing hypothesis number one um, through scientific experiment, there would be other hypotheses that would come to his mind. And then as you test those other hypotheses, still more hypotheses come to your mind. And so it becomes evident to him that uh, you know there are so many hypotheses that he's not actually going to be able to test them all. And at first he thinks, you know, this is kind of funny and amusing, and he, he coins this sort of funny law, you know, in the spirit of, um, I can't remember what Parkinson's law is, but you know, you've heard of like Murphy's law, right? That, uh, you know, whatever can go wrong will. And so he coins this law that's intended to have that kind of humorous, uh, that sort of humorous meaning that the number of rational hypotheses that can explain any given phenomenon is infinite. And so it's intended to be humorous at first, but when he starts to think about it, he thinks, well, wait a second, that's actually completely unacceptable. That actually throws some severe doubts upon the value of the scientific method. In fact, that kind of rips the whole rug out from underneath the scientific method. And the reason for that, he says, you know, uh, he began to have some doubts about the humor or the benefits of it. And he considers it to be uh, almost a total disproof of the validity and utility of the scientific method. And the reason for that is this, that what the scientific method does fundamentally is it tests hypotheses, right? 
So you come up with a hypothesis, you come up with a potential explanation for whatever is going wrong, or you know, even for whatever is going right, and then you test that, right? But the problem is, if there's an infinite number of, you know, potentially valid hypotheses, you can't possibly test all of the hypotheses. And so you can't possibly come to a knowledge that you've found the only correct explanation because there's always more that you can test. Now, you can test any individual hypothesis and say, yes, this is an explanation of the data or no, this is not an explanation of the data. You know, uh, for example, if my computer is not turning on, I use a lot of computer related examples for some reason, perhaps it's because I'm sitting in front of one. But if your computer is not turning on, you can uh, hypothesize, well, the reason for that is because it is not plugged in. So you can find the power plug and see if it's plugged in, right? That's your experiment. You have a hypothesis that it's not plugged in. You can test it by, uh, by observing whether or not it's plugged in. And then if it is not plugged in, then you can plug it in and say, okay, well, that's a potential explanation, right? But here's the interesting thing is that there's a potentially infinite number of reasons why your computer's not turning on. You know, perhaps it is because uh, some water got onto the motherboard, right? Or perhaps it's because um, the motherboard itself has gone old and is defunct. Or perhaps there's... Uh, you know, some kind of uh, problem or malfunction in the power supply. Or perhaps it's that the hard drive has become corrupted and it can't, uh, you know, boot from the operating system because it can't find its, it can't find the proper files for the operating system in order to boot. You know, or perhaps there's, um, you know, some kind of error in the RAM um, such that it's, it's not permitting itself to boot. Or perhaps, you know, there's, there's a whole host of other potential explanations, right? Uh, you know, one potential explanation is that the power grid has gone down and there's no electricity in your house at all. Right, so notice that if your computer's not turning on, there's actually a potentially infinite number of hypotheses, and I can test those hypotheses. But even if I test a single hypothesis, for instance, the power cable, and I plug in the power cable, that doesn't necessarily mean that I understand why the computer wouldn't turn on, because there are other reasons why the computer couldn't be turning on. Perhaps, you know, I plug it in and I press the power button again, and uh, it still won't turn on. I actually had an experience very much like this. Um, I bought a secondhand computer that used to be used as a server, and on the front of the computer, there was a power button, and a restart button, and then there were also two USB ports. And um, when I bought the computer, there was something very odd happening, which is that the reset button was operating as the power button. The power button wouldn't work at all, and neither would the USB ports. The USB ports wouldn't work. So here I have a problem. I have a phenomenon in the world, and I'd like to understand it because I actually want to use those USB ports on the front, and also it's strange and confusing and unsettling that the power button isn't doing what the power button is supposed to do, right? So I have a phenomenon and I need to explain it. I need some kind of theory. And I can form a hypothesis, right? But there's actually a potentially um, infinite number of hypotheses. And, and by the way, I, I agree with Val that depending on how you slice it, there really are, in, in the chat, I agree with Val that depending on how you slice it, there really are an infinite number of unique hypotheses. And, and it does depend a little bit on how you slice it, right? You can sort of categorize these high hypotheses. Um, certainly there's enough hypotheses that you can never test all of them, right? And uh, so suffice it, so, you know, as I'm looking at that problem with the computer, it's not easy to tell where the problem is and I can generate a near infinite number of hypotheses, right? Maybe there's something in the software. Well, where in the software? I have no idea where in the software. It could be anywhere in the software. You know, maybe it's an issue with the motherboard. Maybe it's an issue with the wiring. Maybe it's an issue with this, that, or the other. And there's really no way, uh, you know, there's nothing in the data that precisely tells me uh, what the correct hypothesis, or excuse me, there is, you know, I can test hypotheses against the data, but there's nothing in the data that suggests, uh, you know, that suggests the hypotheses, right? Um, so what I actually found out is that there was a miswiring problem. I can't even remember how I found it. Um, I just, I, I think what happened was um, I, I was taking apart a portion of the computer one day and I plugged it, I wasn't certain how to plug a certain thing in, whether it should go in this way or whether it should be reversed and go in this way. And so I Googled it and I looked at some diagrams and I, I plugged it in the way that the diagrams told me to. Um, and then the USB ports on the front started working and the power button and the restart button started working exactly the way they were supposed to work. And so, uh, you know, apparently it was wired wrong in the first place. Um, Another example of this is, um, so the, the car that I own, um, when I first bought it, it had, it was throwing out an error message through the computer and the error message that it was throwing out uh, was that there was too much oxygen in the engine. There was too much oxygen in the fuel air mixture. And there's actually a whole host of potential reasons why that could be. And I ended up testing like 10 different hypotheses probably um, before I eventually found the right hypothesis and was able to fix the problem and uh, get the error code to go away. 
And some of these hypotheses were quite, uh, you know, expensive and difficult to test. Part of it involved taking apart half the engine and replacing um, the gaskets on the intake, on the air intake manifold. And that required, you know, that was a real adventure because I had never taken apart an engine or even come close to taking apart an engine. Um, and it actually turned out that that was not the solution, right? So there's a, there's a whole host of potential hypotheses and you can't possibly test them all, right? And, you know, that's, that's evidenced by the fact that I actually, you know, tested nine different hypotheses before I found the right hypothesis. And the right hypothesis was actually something very absurdly simple. I just had to replace the air filter, which was $10 and required about 10 minutes to replace. Right, and so the, there's a, there's a huge number of hypotheses, potentially infinite. I think it's infinite, and it's not clear where you should start, and you can't test all of them, and so you can never be sure that you've got the right answer. Um. Okay, so this infinite number of hypotheses, and he says that's a problem, and so uh, you know you can't test all the hypotheses, and he says you know that means that the results of any experiment are inconclusive. And so if the entire scientific method is designed to establish proven knowledge, then the scientific method can never, can never accomplish that task. Now again, if the goal is to just get the computer to turn on, or if the goal is just to get the car to run, you can achieve that goal, right? Um, but if the goal is to achieve sort of a perfect framework of knowledge, um, then you can't achieve that because there's always more tests you need to do. And so Einstein's rationale for this that Pearson quotes is, he says, evolution has shown that at any given moment, out of all conceivable constructions, all the conceivable explanations or hypotheses, a single one has always proved itself absolutely superior to the rest. And he let it go to that. But Pearson says, to Phaedrus, that's an incredibly weak answer. The phrase at any given moment really shook him because that seems to suggest that truth is a function of time. Right? And that seems to annihilate the most basic presumption of all science, because the way that most of us think about science is science is going to find those truths that are objectively true, that are true for all time, right? No matter where you go in the universe, and no matter where you are in the history of humanity, the law of gravity is always true. It's always true, right? That's the whole point of, the, of, of science. Um, you know, at least that's the way that we normally think about it. Um, and so the fact that that science, the fact that this hypothesis problem causes the scientific method to fail in the task of creating proven knowledge seems to, you know, destroy the whole, the whole scientific project. It just, it just nukes the whole thing. Um, sorry, just one second. And uh, what's interesting is you, as you look at the history of scientific endeavor, this is actually precisely what you see, and this is exactly what Pearson says, and it's, it's good enough that I'll just read it straight. But there it was, the whole history of science, a clear story of continuously new and changing explanations of old facts, right? Remember, everyone believes that there's an atom. Everyone believes that there's this some, you know, tiny particle that makes up everything, right? But the explanation of it changes from the plum pudding model to the atomic model, um, you know, to, or to, excuse me, from the plum pudding model to the planetary model, to the shell model, to the probability wave model, right? All these explanations keep changing over time. He says, the time spans of permanence seemed completely random. He could see no order in them. Some scientific truth seemed to last for centuries, others for, le for less than a year. Scientific truth was not dogma, good for eternity, but a temporal quantitative entity that could be studied like anything else. He studied scientific truths, then became upset even more by the apparent cause of their temporal condition. It looked as though the time spans of scientific truths are an inverse function of the intensity of scientific effort. Right, so there's this other problem that the more science you do, the more um, the more scientific acti activity you engage in, the more times you run the scientific method, the shorter the time span of all these scientific truths becomes. Right, um, so some scientific truths last for centuries. Right, and uh, Newton's explanation of gravity, uh, you know, lasts for several hundred years. Um, well, I shouldn't talk about that because I'm actually not sure exactly how long it lasted before we gained a more sophisticated idea of of how to think about gravity, but uh, like the plum pudding model, right? So Democritus's uh, model of the atom, Democritus is an ancient Greek um, philosopher who, who came up with the idea of atom and he said the atom and he, atom in Greek means indivisible. So whatever atoms are there, whatever the smallest particle in the universe is, that's an atom. That's what Democrat, Dem Democritus said. Um, and you know, that persists for, I don't know the exact date, something on the order of 2000 years, right? Until I, I believe it's in the 1800s that you get the plum pudding theory of the atom. You know, and then that theory only lasts for 
uh, and I'm, I'm being very fast and loose with the numbers here, and I apologize, but for, say, 100 years until the planetary model of the atom comes out, and that lasts for only, you know, 30 to 50 years until we say, well, we think it's a lot more, you know, that they're shells, right? That there's these electrons sitting in shells, right? And then that lasts only 10 or 20 years before we say, well, the way we should really think about it is that they're not shells, they're just wave functions. They're, excuse me, they're probability wave functions, right? So there's just a certain probability that the electrons will be there, but they're not exactly like flying around the atom. They're just best represented that there is a certain probability that the atoms are there or aren't there, right? So the more science we've done, the shorter each scientific explanation has lasted, right? And, uh, you know, this is, you know, also true sort of in a technological sense, right? The more the more uh, energy and money and time and effort we invest into technology, it seems like the shorter the time frame of any particular given technology is, right? So telephones have existed since the late 1800s, I believe, right? Um, but uh, cell phones have only existed, let's see, again, I'm playing a little fast and loose for pr probably about 20 or 25 or 30 years, right? And smartphones have only existed for the last, I would say, 15 or so years. I hope that's approximately correct. 15 or 20 years, right? And when you think about the smartphones now, right, like my smartphone has three gigabytes of RAM. That's more RAM than, than my first laptop had. That's more RAM than the computers I grew up with had, right? Um, and so the sort of the, you know, it, it gets to the point where you might have to replace your phone or laptop every few years. Whereas Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, you know, it, the fundamental design of the telephone that he invented worked for, you know, round, uh, in round numbers about a century, right? And now it's kind of going out of vogue. Uh, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't have a landline. I don't think my parents have a landline. I don't know how many people still have landlines. Certainly it's not as used as a cell phone. All right, so the same thing seems to be happening, happening in technology where the more we innovate and the more we explore and the more we create and the more money and time and effort and people we throw at these, the shorter the, shorter the duration of each technological invention. All right, it's the, it's the same sort of inverse function, right? The, the thing that makes it particularly, and you know that's kind of nice and cool for technology, the thing that makes it really threatening for science, and this is what I think Phaedrus found threatening about it, is that presumably what science is supposed to do is it's supposed to tell us the way the universe really is. It's supposed to give us some unchanging, permanent, you know, atemporal, uh, eternal scientific truths. It's supposed to tell us what things are really like. And Phaedrus' conclusion here is that science isn't doing that at all. Instead of selecting one truth from among the multitude of possible truths, it's actually increasing the multitude of possible truths. And so the way he describes it, it's this incredible phrase, is it scientifically produced anti-science. It's chaos. The purpose of scientific method is to select a single truth from among many hypothetical truths. That more than anything else is what science is all about. But historically, science has done exactly the opposite. Through, multipli through multiplication, Upon multiplication of facts, information, theories, and hypotheses, it is science itself that is leading mankind from single absolute truths to multiple indeterminate relative ones. The major producer of social chaos, the indeterminacy of thought and values that rational knowledge is supposed to eliminate, is none other than science itself. And again, you know, I'm very curious um, for anyone who, you know, has a significantly, who has a scientific background, let's say, more comparable to Phaedrus's and less comparable to mine, because mine is quite weak. Um, I'm curious how this uh, concords with your own, um, with your own experience, whether it concords with your laboratory work. Um, what I find particularly striking is that um, the body of knowledge that I'm most recently familiar with, which uh, is related to English, and was, which is related to rhetoric, um, something that many people don't know is that in the pre-modern world, say in the Renaissance and in the ancient Greek and Roman world, um, rhetoric was not just a question of style. It was not just uh, a set of tools for sort of uh, embellishing your speech. It was not just a tools for making writing and talking beautiful. Not at all. Instead, it was seen as a tool for helping to make decisions. It was seen as a tool for grappling with practical problems. And uh, there's uh, one let's say, scholar or practitioner of rhetoric from the Renaissance who drew a distinction that I find particularly interesting. He said what science does um, is, it, is it tries to create these single, um, these single monolithic eternal truths. Um, but what rhetoric does is rhetoric is concerned with the temporal flow around us where 
you know, you can't necessarily find the one right answer, but instead you need to choose in sort of a probabilistic manner um, from among many alternatives. And so he thinks that rhetoric is built for grappling with uncertainty. And science is built for grappling um, with certainty, that science works particularly well when you have the time and leisure to find the single one correct answer. Um, but the rhetoric is particularly well adjusted for um, probabilistically determining what the most likely answer is. And this, uh, you know, it actually ends up being quite important because in our daily lives, we rarely have the experience of certainty, right? So for instance, when you go out and drive on the road, you do not have certainty that there isn't a drunk driver who's going to kill you. You don't have that certainty at all. What you have is a probability right? And that probability is good enough. So a lot of our decisions actually end up hinging on probability, not on certainty. So I find that particularly interesting as, as I look at this, and this is, uh, you know, relevant to this discussion because um, it, it turns out that maybe, right, and we tend to think that science is good for everything, right? Like science is going to, you know, it, it's going to lengthen our lifespans, it's going to cure diseases, it's going to give us leisure time, it's going to make our jobs easier, perhaps one day it will make humans immortal, you know, people just won't die anymore because we'll be able to reverse aging. We tend to look at science as sort of the answer to all of our problems. And so Phaedrus's, Phaedrus's attack here, I think, or, or you know, his, it's, it's not so much an attack because it's not malicious, but his criticism, it's absolutely devastating. It's absolutely devastating because he's saying, you know, science, you know, insofar as it's trying to find truths that you can rely on, uh, it, it's apparently totally failing at that. It's apparently totally failing at that because of this uh, problem of hypotheses, right? And yet, you know, this isn't a, a an unrestricted and unqualified criticism of the scientific method because even Phaedrus would concede, you know, as his teachers and professors probably said, and as his classmates said, you know, but the scientific method works. You know, it does help us produce vaccines. Uh, it does help us, you know, generate electricity from the sun, right? Uh, it does help us put a, a, a rover on Mars. It does help us do all of these things. Um, and so it's, it's it, you know, his, his criticism is not intended to be totally unqualified, but it is intended to say, hey, there's something deeper under here that's not working. We, it, it's not necessarily that science is wrong, but it is that we have the wrong idea about science. We don't understand yet what the scientific method is. We don't understand where it comes from. We don't understand why it works. And, you know, this actually becomes quite helpful. You might say, well, but again, the thing works, so just keep using it. But it actually turns out that if you dig into the principles undergirding things, um, you can then use those same principles to fix other problems, right? So, um, you know, if, if I understand the mechanics of my computer or the mechanics of my car, if I understand those sort of underlying reasons why it works, then when it breaks, I can fix it. Right. Um, or when other similar and I, and I can use those same principles to do other things. Right. So, uh, you know, the principles of electricity that undergird um, computers are, are similar, you know, in, in some ways, they're the exact same principles that govern, you know, how to create an electrical grid or how to, you know, wire up a house for electricity. So these, these principles are transferable to other situations. And so Phaedrus's project is quite justified, I would say. Um, and I personally find it quite interesting. I, I find it quite interesting. Um, okay. So, lateral drifting. So that's that's Phaedrus' experience at the university. And so now we're on to the lateral drifting. So for this uh, period of lateral drifting, and I, I want to emphasize, let's, let's talk about lateral drifting a little bit at the beginning. When you know what it is that you're aiming for, what you do is you progress towards it. If you know you want to go to a certain city, then... You can map out your path on the roads and you can travel on those roads and get to the city, right? If you want to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, well, you know exactly how to do that and you can aim straight for it, right? You can say, well, I need bread and I need a knife and I need peanut butter and I need jelly and then I'm going to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So to the degree that your goal is known and specified, you can aim for it. And that's what most of us normally do. However, there's also a category of actions that we engage in. There's sort of a style of life that we often live where we're really not sure what our goals are, right? So you might experience this you know, as you're choosing what major to study in college, where you think, well, there's a lot of majors and I actually don't know what I should aim for. I can't properly direct myself towards a goal and I can't properly map the path towards that goal, right? Or, you know, for instance, this happens a lot, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in romantic relationships, especially as you approach um, points where, you know, where you have, you know, define the relationship moments where you're like, okay, you know, so like, you know, are, is this going to be an exclusive thing between us? You know, or perhaps you're, you're thinking about marriage and the question is, well, should I want this thing, right? It's, it's not even just, uh, you know, I want it, how do I get it? It's, you know, should I even be aiming this for, for this thing? Should I even be heading towards it, right? And, we, you know, we all face this um, in varying ways and in other ways, you know, uh, choosing a major in romantic relationship seem like two particularly 
um, striking ways in which we do this. But we, you know, we do this all the time. You know, um, sometimes you even wake up in the morning and you're like, okay, I'm not sure. And perhaps you do this as part of your schoolwork or as part of, you know, just your ordinary life or as part of your job. And you think, okay, I'm not actually sure which jobs are worth my time, right? I'm actually not quite sure what to aim at, right? And so this is the problem that Phaedrus is in, right? He, uh, the way that Piercy describes it is that he's in kind of this stunned and shocked state. And so he engages in a period of lateral drifting. And what lateral drifting is, is it's what you do when you are not quite sure what you're aiming at. And you're not quite sure what you should be aiming at. And so what you do um, is, you know, uh, you just kind of wander and mosey around. You know, it's, it's kind of like the classic thing that, uh, you know, that college students do when they backpack across Europe or whatever. Or if you're from Europe, maybe you back across, backpack across Asia or across the United States or whatever, right? And the answer is, well, I'm not quite sure what the most valuable thing I should be aiming at is. So let's just kind of drift sideways. Let's just kind of explore sideways a little bit and uh, hope that we find something. And it actually turns out that that's all you can do in that kind of a situation. Because again, the, the core issue here is that you're not sure what to aim at. If you knew what to aim at, then you could figure out the best way to, to get that thing. But if you're not sure what to aim at, you're, you're kind of stuck. But again, you know, we're all in the situation that we have to do something. And so that's something that you do is, is lateral drifting. It's drifting sideways. And that's what um, Phaedrus does for quite a while. Uh, let's see. I'll go through a few of the examples he has, right? Um, and the way that Piercic has a great way of describing these lateral truths. He says, at first the truths Phaedrus began to pursue. Let's see. Excuse me. At first the truths that Phaedrus began to pursue were lateral truths, no longer the frontal truths of science, those toward which the discipline pointed, but the kind of truth you see laterally out of the corner of your eye. I love that metaphor. That's such a good metaphor. In a laboratory situation, when your whole procedure goes haywire, when everything goes wrong, or is indeterminate, or is so screwed up by unexpected results you can't make head or tail out of anything, you start looking laterally. That's a word he used to describe a growth of knowledge that doesn't move forward like an arrow in flight, but expands sideways, like an arrow enlarging in flight. Or like the archer, discovering that although he has hit the bullseye and won the prize, his head is on a pillow and the sun is coming in the window. Lateral knowledge is knowledge that's from a wholly unexpected direction, from a direction that's not even understood as a direction until the knowledge forces itself upon one. Lateral truths point to the falseness of axioms and postulates underlying one's existing system of getting at truth. Right, so if you are in one of these situations where you're experiencing suckness and where you start to engage in lateral drifting, you know, part of the reason why you engage in lateral drifting, it's, it's not just because sort of your existing understanding of the world is insufficient to point you in any direction. It's also because your understanding of how to sort of create that framework, right? Your understanding of, of, of how to build that classical understanding of the world around you, uh, that map, um, that, that's, yeah, that conceptual framework, right? Or that, or that map. Um, not only is that map wrong, but whatever tools you use to build that map are now suspect as well, right? There might've been something wrong with them. And so lateral truths point... Uh, not only towards saying, hey, your map is not quite right, but it also points towards the idea that, hey, maybe your way of building that map is not quite right. And this all goes back to the very first chapters of Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, you know, and actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it out, I think, if I can find it. Um, yeah, okay, I remember. So he's talking about how, you know, at the beginning, John and Sylvia and himself would take the main roads. And eventually they discovered that the back roads were way better for motorcycle trips. And the way that he describes it is that, let's see, I'm using a different copy of the book than I usually do, so it's throwing me off. Okay, okay, okay. I'll find it, I'll find it. It'll all be worth it in the end, everybody. The dripping faucet. The engine flooded with gasoline. It's right here. I know it is. <laughs> 
There we go. All right. So it's, he talks about, you know, finding the back roads and finding how use or how, how good of an experience it is to ride motorcycles on the back roads instead of main highways, how it's a totally different experience, much better experience. And he says, I've wondered why it took us so long to catch on. We saw it and yet we didn't see it, or rather we were trained not to see it, conned perhaps into thinking that the real action was metropolitan and all this was just boring hinterland. It was a puzzling thing. The truth knocks on the door and you say, go away. I'm looking for the truth. Puzzling. And so that's the exact sort of thing that he's describing here is that, uh, you know, if your whole framework of looking for answers and solutions is wrong, then you need to, uh, I mean, fundamentally, you need to abandon or modify that framework. But that's very difficult because it's not just, uh, it's not just your answers. It's how you arrive at your answers. It's the whole framework by which you um, view and evaluate things. Right, and that makes it quite difficult to do. And that's what the whole purpose of lateral drifting is, is it's to say, not only do we have the wrong answers, but we're also asking the wrong questions. And until we learn to ask the right sorts of questions, we won't ever get the satisfactory answers that we're really looking for. It's a really good way of thinking about it. Um, that's a really good way of thinking about it. So um, he ends up joining the army. He ends up spending some time um, deployed in Korea. He has a couple of um, striking experiences there that are preserved through um, his memories even after um, even after he goes insane and is subjected to electroshock therapy um, and he has this interesting experience after he's discharged from the army where he sits in a hotel room for two thinks or excuse me for two weeks um, he says eating enormous washington apples and thinking and eating more apples and thinking some more and what he's thinking about um, what he's what he ends up thinking about is philosophy and his lateral drift, the sort of lateral drifted experiences where he just sort of wanders sideways and uh, is not really sure what he's aiming for, what he should be aiming for. Um, yeah, actually, sorry, I'm, I'm going to interrupt myself because something just made, sense, made quite a bit more sense for me right there, which is, you know, when you have a goal, that goal, and my understanding is that this is actually true psychologically and, uh, and, and neurologically, when you have a goal or a destination or an aim, perceptually your whole world arranges itself around that aim and everything arranges itself either as an obstacle to that aim or as an aid to that aim or as something that's totally irrelevant for instance if i wanted to go to a city that's an hour drive away um, because i have that goal all of the roads are now either roads that lead me away from my goal or roads that lead me towards my goal right and now everything is a problem or a potential solution in order to get me there. For instance, if my car is working, well, that's good. If my car is broken down, that's an obstacle or a roadblock. And the reason why it's an obstacle or a roadblock is because of my aim. If I didn't care about going to that other city, it wouldn't be an obstacle that my car is broken down. It would be a completely irrelevant fact. And of course, if I was a mechanic, it's actually you know not an obstacle at all that somebody's car is broken down. Instead, it's a, it's a genuinely positive good because it gives me work. Um, it helps me make my living. And, you know, perhaps I'm also quite interested in cars. And so it's, you know, I derive a little bit of intellectual satisfaction from it as well. Right. And so notice that the fact that the car is broken down is either an obstacle or an aid, depending upon what my goal is. So what my goal does is it's is it's it creates the framework through which I perceive the world. Right. Um, it, it changes everything so that everything now becomes laid out as either um, a means to my end or an obstacle to my end that I need to overcome or else as totally irrelevant um, towards my towards my goal right to totally irrelevant phenomena in the same way that you know i could i could look around and right now i see a mechanical pencil right and until a moment ago that mechanical pencil was totally irrelevant towards you know any goals that i have right now because i'm streaming and talking to all of you um and so it's just totally irrelevant you know the fact that youtube servers are up that's uh you know uh, that's a it's a helpful phenomena that gives me an aid towards my goals and you know if the youtube servers went down then that would be some kind of obstacle that i would have to overcome and that you know i probably wouldn't be able to overcome because i don't manage the youtube servers right although if there was a mechanical problem if there was a some kind of technological problem at my end then i would try to fix that okay so so this is the insight that i just had that i wanted to explain right that it's your aim it's your goal it's your destination that creates the conceptual fra framework through which you view and evaluate the world okay so what lateral drifting is the time when that happens you know real stuckness is not just uh, it's not just that your car breaks down because if your car breaks down well actually we know how to deal with that you know either it's something that you can fix yourself or else you take it to a garage and you uh, pay for it to be fixed what 
what really causes a problem is when I don't know what I'm doing, right? When I don't have an aim or I don't have a goal or perhaps the aims or goals to which I've been um, devoting myself seem insufficient or inadequate, which is what happens to Phaedrus, right? Um, at, at the university when he's studying biochemistry. Um, and hello everybody to chat, and by the way, uh, John said, hey JS, so I just wanna uh, say, well, hey everybody, um, you know, whether you're lurking or whether you comment in chat, it's great to have you here. Um, so when you when you disturb that aim, when you don't know what your aim is, or when you don't know what objective it, what your objective is, it actually destroys the whole framework and map of the world, or or at least calls it all um, into question, right? And so many people have this experience. For example, you know, if, um, if you're relate, if you're raised um, uh, religious, and as you get older, you start to, um, you know, uh, question the answers and explanations and modes of life that your religion provides, and then you know perhaps you uh, convert to another religion, or perhaps you. Um, reject religion entirely and become either agnostic or atheist. Um, that's sort of what happens. So what you're doing is you're actually not just questioning um, sort of the answers that are generated. Instead, you're questioning the whole mode of generating answers. You're questioning the whole framework, right? And that and that comes by um, you know questioning sort of the final aims and destinations um, of, of that system. And the same thing can happen in reverse, right? Um, that some an individual who is agnostic or atheist um, can encounter either arguments or experiences. Um, or, or something like that that um, deeply challenges their worldview and causes them to sort of have to reconstruct this whole thing. And so that's what Phaedrus is encountering here. He's, he's encountering a large-scale reconstruction of what it is that the world is made of and what it is that the world means. So I hope you see, like, I mean, this is relevant to a lot of people. If this has never happened to you, um, well, I guess the first thing I'd say is you're probably quite young because you'll, you'll encounter it soon enough, right, um, in larger or smaller measure that you'll run up against experiences and data that are so wholly inconsistent with your view of life um, that they uh, start taking apart that whole framework and you have to find a way to rebuild that framework. And while you're trying to rebuild that framework, you're laterally drifting. So the termination of his lateral drift actually ends up in philosophy, right? And the reason why is because, uh, you know, um, the reason why he ends up in philosophy is because philosophy is interested in uh, questions about hypotheses. It's interested in all kinds of questions. It's interested in some of the, you know, the deepest and most complex and most abstract questions that humans encounter, right? So the questions about hypotheses were not interested, interesting to scientists because scientists just want to apply the scientific method to generate scientific knowledge, right? Um, but the philosophers are interested in questions. They're interested in the philosophy of science. They're interested in, okay, well, you know, what is this scientific method thing and why does it work and where does it all come from and what are hypotheses and where did they come from? Um, it is quite interested in these sorts of questions. Um, and so he ends up back at philosophy. There's actually kind of a fun uh, experiment you can do. You can go to Wikipedia and uh, hit random article. And actually, you know, I'll, uh, well, no, no, I won't demonstrate it right now, but you can go and do this yourself. It's actually quite, quite interesting and quite entertaining. So you go to Wikipedia, you hit a random article, and it will generate, you know, some random article, uh, some circus in Canada or something like that, or a particular asteroid. And so what you do then is you click on the first link in the article that isn't, uh, you know, part of the definition, basically, or excuse me, that isn't part of like the etymology, right? Because if you do that, you'll just get, you know, caught in a bunch of verbal Wikipedia pages. But if you um, click the first link in every page that is not part of the, uh, the sort of the etymology of the word, um, eventually, if you keep clicking those first links, you will end back on the philosophy page. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, as Piercing says here, um, philosophy is sort of the it's the highest echelon of human knowledge, right? It deals with the biggest and the most abstract and the most generalized questions that humans ever deal with. And if you're somebody who has studied philosophy, this is just a truism to you. You just take this for granted. And you know, if you're the kind of person who studies philosophy in an academic way, you probably derive you know, quite, quite a sense of superiority from that in some respects because you feel like you're dealing with the most fundamental questions that humans ask, the most important questions that humans ask, the deepest questions that humans ask. Um, but to Phaedrus, who doesn't have a background in philosophy, this is a total revelation, right? And, excuse me, I'm trying to find, uh, uh, I, I, want, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. Okay. And so, so philosophy is going to ask these questions, you know, like, well, what is, what is a good human life? You know, what kind of human life is the best life? And how should we live? Those are questions that are related to ethics. It also asks questions about, you know, when we say we know something, what does it mean that we know something? And how can you really know that you know something? 
and you how can you know that you don't, don't just suspect it or how can you know that you're not deceived and those are questions of epistemology and there's also questions um, of, of what the world is made of right is the world fundamentally just made of mass and energy or is uh, there some kind of uh, you know what we would call supernatural or spiritual or uh, non-physical component to the world right um, uh, you, you know, those are questions of metaphysics right um, you know, uh, you can also ask questions, for example, about aesthetics. Aesthetics is the branch of philosophy that deals with um, what is beautiful. So, you know, when we say something is beautiful, what does that mean? Is beauty and a quality that inheres in the object that you're talking about, or is it just, um, or is, or when we say something is beautiful, is that, uh, you know, purely a subjective reaction on our parts? Is, is it only an opinion, right? And so you've probably heard the statement, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. These are the questions that philosophers ask, right? And this is what philosophy is all about, is digging into these most fundamental questions. Right? These, these questions that sort of undergird everything, or that, if you prefer, overarch everything. Or if you prefer yet another metaphor, that are secretly embedded in everything. They're all pervasive throughout all the experiences we have. Right? So Phaedrus discovers, well, these questions weren't scientific questions, as it turns out. These were philosophic questions, so let's do some digging into philosophy. And um, I'm going to address, he talks about human Kant. And I'm going to address that very briefly, and perhaps a little imperfect, imperfectly, um, but I am going to address it very briefly um, before I close off here. And the reason for that is because uh, not only is it interesting in itself, and not only, as Piercing says, does it kind of give a view of um, what philosophy is and how it works and the kinds of questions it asks, um, but also it provides a bit of a pattern for what Piercing is trying to accomplish over the course of the whole, this whole book, and so I'll explain what that is. And Piercing's analogy for, um, or his sort of metaphor for what philosophy is and what philosophers do, is it's um, a journey through the high country of the mind. And let's see, I believe he talks about it. And right now, Piercing and uh, John and Sylvia are traveling on their motorcycles through a through a hilly, elevated, mountainous area. And so they're in a high country. And so what Piercing says is, I want to talk about another kind of high country now in the world of thought, which in some ways, for me at least, seems to parallel or produce feelings similar to this and call it the high country of the mind. If all of human knowledge, everything that's known, is believed to be an enormous hierarchic structure, then the high country of the mind is found at the uppermost reaches of this structure in the most general, the most abstract considerations of all. all right, so philosophy doesn't ask, you know, just, uh, you know, what should I eat for breakfast this morning? But it asks questions like, uh, you know, it, it asks the more pervasive general questions, you know, like, should you eat breakfast? How, you know, what is, what is a human life worth? Is a human life worth anything? If so, why? If not, why not? If it's worth a certain amount, then how much is it worth and why? So it asks much more general questions, as he says, the most general, the most abstract considerations. Few people travel here. There's no real profit to be made from wandering through it. Yet, like this high country of the material world all around us, it has its own austere beauty that to some people make the hardships of traveling through it seem worthwhile. In the high country of the mind, one has to become adjusted to the thinner air of uncertainty and to the enormous magnitude of questions asked and to the answers proposed to these questions. And by the way, this is such a good introduction. Man, if you are ever interested in getting into philosophy, this is such a good introduction to philosophy and the way you should think about it. Um, and also it explains, you know, if you're the kind of person who is not into philosophy, it, it explains so much why, um, you know, those of us who are quite interested in philosophic questions are into philosophic questions. It's not necessarily because of their utility, because often it's hard to see the utility of these questions, right? The, the questions that philosophers pose. It's hard to see their immediate use or their immediate application. But as he says, right, um, you know, it has an austere beauty. Philosophy, these high abstract questions do have an austere beauty. And for um, many of us, it's worthwhile to travel through that high country of the mind for the sake of that austere beauty, um, even though the ideas don't immediately appear to have practical applications. He goes on, so in the high country of the mind, one has to become adjusted to the thinner air of uncertainty and to the enormous magnitude of the questions asked and to the answers proposed to these questions. The sweep goes on and on and on, so obviously much further than the mind can grasp that one hesitates even to go near for fear of getting lost in them and never finding one's way out. And you know, you, you probably know people like this who are so caught up in their philosophy and so caught up in ideas um, that they, you know, they, they lose track with what's most important in their lives, right? And so, you know, the same kind of risk exists when you're traveling through real high country, right? When you're traveling through alpine environments, um, you know, there's real risks to your life. Uh, and yet many people find it worthwhile um, to go backpacking in the mountains or to go on ski trips or even just to, to drive through or ride through. Um, what is the truth and how do you know it when you have it? How do we really know anything? 
Is there an I, a soul, which knows? Or is this soul merely cells coordinating senses? Is reality basically changing, or is it fixed and permanent? When it's said that something means something, what's meant by that? Many trails through these high ranges have been made and forgotten since the beginning of time, and although the answers brought back from these trails have claimed permanence and universality for themselves, civilizations have varied in the trails they have chosen, and we have many different answers to the same question. Even within a single civilization, old trails are constantly closed and new ones opened up. Do, 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 do. Phaedrus wandered through this high country, aimlessly at first, following every path, every trail where someone had been before, seeing occasionally with small hindsights that he was apparently making some progress, but seeing nothing ahead that told him of which way to go. Right, more sideways drifting. Through the mountainous questions of reality and knowledge had passed great figures of civilization, some of whom, like Socrates and Aristotle and Newton and Einstein, were, for, were known to almost everyone, but most of whom were far more obscure, right? Like Kant and Hume, who you really only know if you're into philosophy, whereas you know about Socrates and Aristotle if, if you're a human being, pretty much, right? Or even if you've watched The Princess Bride. Um, he became fascinated with their thought, their whole way of thinking. He followed their trails carefully until they seemed to grow cold and dropped them. His work was just barely passing by academic standards at this time, but it wasn't because he wasn't working or thinking. He was thinking too hard. And the harder you think in this high country of the mind, the slower you go. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to pick out the most important elements here. Okay, yeah, man, it just strikes me. I hadn't planned on saying this, but that, that's such a good explanation of philosophy and why people find philosophy valuable. You know, I minored in philosophy um, during my undergrad program, and so I spend a fair amount of time with, um, you know, people who have made who have made philosophy their living in the form of tenured professors at the university, um, and then also in, uh, with other students who were either taking philosophy courses for the fun of it, or doing it as part of a minor, or doing it as part of their major, right? And it's such a good introduction to philosophy. It's such a good introduction, not just to philosophy, but to why people study philosophy and the value that some people find in it and the reason why other people don't find value in it. Okay, so Kant and Hume, or more precisely, Hume and Kant, because we're going to tackle them in that order. Okay, so David Hume is the Scottish philosopher, and I believe other Joseph has made a video about him. I'm not going to link it here because it would be too difficult, but if you search um, good and basic David Hume, I believe you'll find it. Um, we visited Scotland. It was uh, last year. It was, it was quite nice. It was, I, I believe we found a statue of David Hume, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so Hume has this interesting question, right? So here's an interesting question. What if you took a human being, a baby, right? And this is the kind of, it, it, it's these kinds of questions that show why some people like philosophy and some people don't, because the people who like philosophy are interested in sort of this high country of the mind, right? With its sort of, um, you, you know, austere and sometimes cold and sometimes inhospitable, um, you know, beauty and form. Right? Whereas other people are just like, why are you asking this question, Hume? Anyway, so Hume asked this question. So let's let's take an infant, right? And we're going to deprive this infant of any kind of sensory data, right? So they were born blind. They were born without a sense of taste. They were born without a sense of hearing. They were born without any kind of sense of touch. Um, there's five senses. Any kind of smell, any kind of sense of smell, right? And you know, in the modern world, we would say, well, there's other physical senses too, right? Like your sense of balance um, and so on and so forth. And so Hume's going to say, well, let's deprive them of all of that. They get zero sense data. They've never seen anything. They've never felt anything. They've never touched anything. Um, you know, they've, they've um, never had any kind of physical experience at all. Okay? So the question is, let's take that child and let them grow that way up until they're an adult. And the question is, do they have any ideas in their mind? Can they think of anything? And Hume's answer is no. And the reason for that is because Hume is an empiricist an empiricist and he believes that everything that is in your mind is derived from your sensory experiences around you well, that's what an empiricist is and is an, empir an empiricist is somebody who believes that knowledge comes from the external world it comes from touching things it comes from seeing things it comes from experiencing things right and uh you know the scientific method of pure success is carefully controlled ex empiricism and even things like the hubble space telescope are designed vaguely to imitate the human eye right you know, presumably if the human eye were a little bit more powerful and built like the Hubble telescope, then we could see into space and see the things that the Hubble telescope sees, right? Um, 
and, and, and so the scientific method basically operates by empiricism. It, extend, it, it operates by extending the human senses, the human ability to perceive physical phenomena, to have these physical empirical experiences, and then to derive knowledge from them. So Hume says that's the only way you can get knowledge. All of the knowledge you have is, um, is, is, the physical world, is from the physical data around you. And so, for example, example he'll say, uh, you know, what do I have here? Um, well, I have my mouse, right? And so he'll say, well, what do you know about that mouse? You know that it's cool, and you know that it's hard, and um, you know you know that it controls the cursor on your computer screen, and the reason why you, all, you know all that is because of empirical observation. And you don't have any knowledge of that thing that isn't derived from your empirical observation. That's why he's going to say the 16-year-old has no ideas in his head, because he was born blind, deaf, mute, etc. No sensory data whatsoever. Okay. And uh, this gets very dicey. Okay, so you might say, well, that's a nice thought experiment, Hume, but, but frankly, who cares, right? Well, here's why you should care. Here's why it becomes a, a bit of a stickier problem for philosophers is because if that's true, then Hume says, Hume's not only going to say all your knowledge of the mouse comes from your sensory data of it. He's going to say there is no mouse. Or better put, you have no evidence. You have no proof. You have no reasonable justification that there actually is any object in my hand right now. And here's why. He's going to say, okay, well, tell me about this thing that you, whoop, I'm clicking now, whoops, tell me about this thing that you call the mouse. In fact, I'm going to flip it off so that I don't accidentally trigger anything, right? Tell me about this thing that you call uh, the mouse. And I'm going to say, well, you know, it's kind of cool to the touch, right? That's sensory data. And uh, it's blue and it's black and it says uh, Logitech on it or Logitech. And, um, you know, it has this wheel that moves. I can manipulate this wheel and the wheel moves. And that's, a, that's what it is. And you know, it also has all these buttons that you can click and it also moves around the cursor on the screen. And what Hume is going to say is Hume is going to say, well, that's very interesting because what you've done here, you haven't actually told me what the mouse is. You've told me about the data that, is, that you're feeling, right? But tell me what the mouse is apart from those things, right? It's not just the fact that it's cool to the touch, right? And it's not just um, you know, the sensations that you get. It's not just the colors, right? Because the colors aren't it. Other things are blue, other things are black. So what's the thing that's giving off those colors? What's the thing that's giving off the sensation of coolness and hardness and kind of rubberiness on the sides and kind of smooth plasticiness on the top? Um, let me just make sure I'm not miss missing anything. I don't believe I am. Um, yeah, so the example that, that Pierce gives, which is quite a good example, um, is with the motorcycle, everything that you know about the motorcycle comes in through the senses, right? Um, and if you say it's made of metal, it's made of substance, then Hume says, well, what's metal? And, of course, the answer is, well, metal is this thing, it's hard, it's shiny, it deforms when it's subjected to blows, um, it becomes more malleable when it's heated to high temperatures, and Hume is going to retort, um, you know, he's going to say, those are all sights, those are all sounds, those are all touch, those are all ex empirical experiences. That's all sense data, that's not substance, that's not the object, right? You're not telling me what the mouse is, you're just telling me the effects that the mouse has on the world around you, and what the effects the mouse has when you interact with it, right? And so this is, uh, this, is, this is the conundrum that Kant tries to tackle, right? Um, he's, he's going to try to explain why there's substance here, why there's actually a mouse here and not just a bunch of sense data. Um, and I hope you'll see that as we go through his explanation, it actually is, it actually is quite clever and it actually um, gives us some, some satisfaction that we would not be able to get um, if, we didn't have, um, if we didn't have Kant's explanation. So what he's going to say, excuse me. All right, yeah, there's a specific quote um, Kant's, from Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. He says that all our knowledge begins with experience, there can be no doubt. But though all knowledge begins with experience, it doesn't follow that it arises from experience. And so it seems like Kant is just splitting hairs here, but it actually turns out being quite um, quite subtle. What Kant is going to say is he's going to say, no, not all knowledge is empirical. Um, there's some knowledge that is empirical, and he calls that, if I'm sorry, I'm going to have to check, because it's not a priori, it's it's the opposite of a priori knowledge. There's, there's somebody in the chat or watching right now who studied philosophy who's laughing at me. Oh yeah, okay, so so Kant, and I, I hope I'm getting this right, I think I'm getting this right, it's been a while since I've dug into all of this. 
right? But Kant says there's, there's actually two kinds of knowledge. It's not all just sense data. That's, uh, he calls it a posteriori knowledge. That is, it's, it's posterior to experience. It's after experience. So once you get some experiences, then you have a posteriori knowledge, right? That's one kind of knowledge. That's the knowledge that Hume is talking about. But there's another kind of knowledge that he calls a priori um, knowledge, and that's knowledge that comes before experience, right? A priori prior to, right? Um, and so this a priori knowledge, sorry, I hope I'm not losing track of things here. Um, this a priori knowledge, here's some examples of a priori knowledge is, um, or a priori, everyone pronounces it differently. You know. um, an example of a priori knowledge is time. You don't see time, you don't hear time, you don't smell time, you don't taste it or touch it. Um, it isn't present in the sense data as they're received, right? When I sense this, I don't sense time, right? Um, but time is what Kant is going to call a priori knowledge. It's it's an intuition. It's knowledge that you have that didn't come with it, or excuse me, didn't come from the sense data, but that did come with the sense data, right? And so he's going to, um, some other examples are space. Um, unless we apply the concepts of space and time to the impressions we receive, the world is unintelligible. It's just a kaleidoscopic jumble of colors and patterns and noises and smells and pain and taste without meaning, right? Um, and so what he's going to say is that um, there's, let's see, there's what he's going to, there's an a priori motorcycle basically, right? Or an a priori mouse. The mouse is a concept that I have. It's knowledge that I have that combines all of the sense data and helps it make sense, right? Um, now, there's something really important here, right? Because if, if you have, if you are not interested in philosophy and some, you have somehow managed to sit through that 10 minute explanation, you're probably thinking my word, JF, like, why does anybody ask these questions? Like the mouse works. I can, everyone knows what a mouse is. Why would you ask these stupid questions? And why is Hume asking these stupid questions? And why is Kant trying to answer these stupid questions? Okay. So what, what Kant is doing here is he's doing something very, very, um, actually quite interesting. He does what, and I believe Kant actually calls it himself this, um, he says it's a Copernican inversion, okay? So to understand what a Copernican inversion is, we're going to have to take a slight pivot over to Copernicus, okay? So let's take a pre-Copernican model of the world where you believe that the sun goes around the earth, right? So the earth is stationary, sun goes around the earth, that's why we see it come up in the east, that's why we see it set in the west. That's perfectly rational and self-explanatory, right? That's the sense data, okay? So um, what Copernicus does is he doesn't say, hey, look, there's new data. It proves that the, earth, that the sun doesn't go around the earth. Instead, what he says is we're going to use all the same data, and instead we're going to say that the earth is going around the sun using all of the same sense data, right? This is kind of like a frame of reference thing, right? If you know anything about Einsteinian relativity, just you know, general relativity, then you know that uh, motion depends upon the frame of reference of the observer, right? So for example... Uh, you know, if I'm on a train, the whole world is moving past. But if you're on the ground watching me on the train, then the train is moving past, right? And um, which one is correct? And the answer is, well, it depends upon which frame of reference you're using. So what Copernicus does with the sun and the earth, the heliocentric and geocentric model, is he says, look, even with just the data we have, there's two different frameworks, two different maps, two different conceptual explanations of what's going on here, two different a priori uh, frameworks, basically right? Even if we have the same experiences, the same sense data, there's two different ways of explaining it. And, um, you know, in, in some sense, they're equally good, right? You know, for most human purposes, if you believe that the sun goes around the earth, like, it, it, it doesn't fundamentally matter, right? Um, it matters in some applications, but it doesn't matter in most. Uh, you know, and even the way that, you know, when you grow up and, you're, and you learn, oh, but the earth goes around the sun, right? It orbits around the sun. Um, you know, what's, what, what's often not mentioned is that the sun itself is moving too, right? So, um, and, and the earth isn't so much going around the sun as it is following it around in the sort of corkscrew, like a toilet drain, um, because the sun is in motion too. So it's not just that the earth is going around the sun, it's that the sun is moving and the earth is, is being flushed down some kind of cosmic drain uh, following the Earth, which is, you know, well, you're welcome for that mental image. Um, so what Hume is, or excuse me, what Kant is doing here is a Copernican inversion. He's not changing my experience of this mouse. He's just providing a better explanation of it, um, you know, that will allow you to do certain things, right? Um, so he's not changing the sense data. You know, when I just go out in the morning, in the same way that Copernicus is not changing the sense data, when you go out in the morning, the sun still comes up in the east and still goes down in the west. 
right? But Copernicus has a different explanation for why it comes up in the east and goes down in the west, right? So um, a lot of what, and the reason why Piercy brings this up is partially to give you an experience of what it's like to be in the high country of the mind. And I hope it hasn't been too um, boring. If it is, you know, frankly, please tell me and I will try to make it more um, more engaging as I do, but it's nice to have kind of a touch point of reference to see how well I'm doing. Um, that's the first reason is to kind of give you all an idea and give the readers an idea of what the high country of the mind looks like. But the other reason is because Piercig or, or Phaedrus is doing a Copernican inversion of a kind too. Um, you know, the way I describe what he does in this book is that he takes all of Western history and philosophy as if it was a tree and he picks it up by the roots and shakes it, shakes the, the roots clean and then plants it down again. And so in most cases, he leaves a lot of Western knowledge intact but he provides a different framework for us to look at and evaluate our knowledge, right? And that different framework, even though it doesn't uh, change most of the knowledge, it changes the way we understand the knowledge, it changes the way we use the knowledge, it changes the way we think about the knowledge, it changes the way we apply the knowledge, and for that reason, it changes the world and changes us, right? And that's ultimately going to be his purpose in this book, um, is to change the way we look at the world and to change the way we live in it, hopefully um, in a way that will be higher quality. Okay, well, man, pat yourself on the back for sitting through all that. I certainly feel like patting myself on the back for sitting through my own explanation. Um, it's worth mentioning one more thing, which is, and, and I'll just go ahead and read it. Kant's metaphysics thrilled Phaedrus at first, but later it dragged and he didn't know exactly why. He thought about it and decided it was maybe his experiences in Korea, these sort of more aesthetic and romantic experiences he had there. He had the feeling of escape from a prison of intellect. And now this was just more of the prison again. He read Kant's aesthetics with disappointment and then anger. Aesthetics is the branch of philosophy that deals with beauty. The ideas expressed about the beautiful were themselves ugly to him. And the ugliness was so deep and so pervasive he hadn't a clue as to where to begin to attack or try to get around it. It seemed woven right into the whole fa fabric of Kant's world so deeply that there was no escape from it. It wasn't just 18th century ugliness or technical ugliness. All the philosophers he was reading showed it. The whole university he was attending smelled of the same ugliness. It was everywhere, in the classroom, in the textbooks. It was in himself, and he didn't know how or why. It was reason itself that was ugly, and there seemed no way to get free. Some of you may have, you know, if you did manage to sit through this, you may have had that same experience as you listened to Hume and Kant's explanations of the world. Is there's this sort of sense, you know, even though you might appreciate it on an intellectual level or a rational level, you think there's something deeply ugly and unsatisfying about those explanations. There's something deeply and ugly and unsatisfying about the nature of explanation itself. You know, I'd comment, by the way, that there's actually some backlash against explanation and rational critique uh, in one of the fields that I'm familiar with, which is the field of English. I have a book that I started and I still have not read called The Limits of Critique. Um, and what it is is, you know, critique is the main tool that literary critics use. That's why they're called literary critics. They criticize things. They critique things, right? And there's this um, book recently published, and it's, it's a reasonably important book called The Limits of Critique. And what it suggests, um, of course, as the title suggests, is that maybe criticism, maybe maybe analysis, maybe what we think of as rationality has some limits. Maybe it's weak in some areas. Maybe it's insufficient in some areas. Maybe, as Piercic says, it has a genetic defect within itself um, that needs to be repaired or fixed or healed in order to be any good. And, you know, that's sort of, um, you know, going back to the whole theme of Piercic's Chautauqua and my Chautauqua, right, in reference to um, uh, systems of various kinds in which we sense the death force. You know, we look at, um, you know, perhaps our system of supplying energy and we think, you know, we agree with it in a kind of rational way, right? Like, it's not easy to ditch hydrocarbons, and yet we still find the hydrocarbons to be kind of unsatisfying. And, you know, perhaps, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, stepping inside um, sort of, I mean, this is a criticism more typically made by right-wing people, or, you know, let's take it like a libertarian perspective, is we don't seem to be able to do without government. Um, but there's something deeply unsatisfying about it that we're very suspicious in regards to, right? Or this, you could do the same thing from sort of a, a cultural or political left-wing perspective. Um, you know, left-wingers tend to be much more suspicious of large corporations and so forth. And so, you know, we really haven't figured out a way to run the world um, that doesn't include corporations, large corporations. And, um, you know, they make sense in sort of this rational, analytical, cerebral way. But there's something deeply unsatisfying about them to many people. Yeah. <sighs>
And that's the same thing that Pierce encounters in philosophy is he finds that somehow the philosophy, all these explanations, even the most brilliant ones, even the ones that make the most sense are somehow, you know, kind of unsatisfying um, in a way, even as much as he agrees with them. And that, that ugliness, that unsatisfyingness, right? That dissatisfaction seems totally pervasive. And it's even in himself as he studies philosophy. And so that's going to be a major question that he continues to think about as he goes, as he continues to write this book and as we continue to go through the book um, and, dis and uh, describe Pierce's experiences and Phaedra's experiences, that's going to be a major concern is, you know, the, the stink of the death force is pervading Pierce and Phaedra's experience. And the question is, how do you get rid of it? And by the way, it, does, it doesn't just pervade Phaedra's experience at the university as he investigates rationality. It also persists, uh, it also persists throughout Pierce's experience riding the motorcycle. You know, one of the most interesting criticisms of this book, um, to me, one of the most interesting criticisms of this book that I hear is that, you know, that, that Piersig, the author is, or, you know, Piersig, the narrator, um, this father who's on a motorcycle trip, he's kind of a jerk, right? He doesn't pay attention to other people. He's kind of lost in his, his own thoughts. He's antisocial. You know, he's not a particularly good father. And what's interesting is that, um, you know, that sort of wrongness seems to be, it seems to be embedded in all of the experiences that he has with the Sutherlands and all of the experiences he has with his son, Chris. You know, it's, it's just embedded throughout the whole thing so deeply and so pervasively that it's not clear how to get rid of it. And Piercing himself, the narrator, detects this at various points during the story. He'll say, you know, there's something wrong about the relationship between myself and Chris, and I can't figure out what it is. Um, and over the course of this book, of course, you know, if you've read this book, you know that... Um, not only is, are, is he going to try to reveal what the ugliness, that pervasive ugliness in philosophy and rationality and technology and science and all these systems that surround us are, not only is he going to reveal um, the source of and the solution to that pervasive ugliness, um, but that is also going to happen for Piercing personally with his son Chris, that that relationship is going to be repaired and that eventually he's going to detect the source of, the, um, of that low quality relationship that he has with the people around him. He's going to detect the source of it and um, when he detects it, he's eventually going to fix it. And, you know, that's a bit of a spoiler alert in case you have not read this book, but, you know, who would really watch hours and hours of a lecture about a book they haven't read? Probably not very many people. So um, I hope that's not too much of a, of a spoiler. Um, that's what's going to happen. And that experience that Piercig has of repairing the relationship with his son, it's not just going to repair the relationship with his son, it's also going to repair his relationship with himself. It's going to make himself into a whole human being again um and it's going to raise the the quality of his own life right and that's going to be a metaphor for and an analogy of and an, even an instance of um the way that he finds he detects the source of the problem the source of the technological death force scientific death force the systemic death force when he finds that and solves that that's going to be an analog of the way that he finds and solves the problem with his son and what that's going to do um is it's going to create a high quality harmonious life, um, a life that doesn't have that sense of ugliness and lostness, but that instead has a deep and satisfying sense of pervasive meaning, um, you know, not without some problems and trials, um, but with a, a golden thread running through the whole experience that makes it worthwhile and that makes it um, deeply satisfying and worth living. And that's what I, in my mind, that's what the book is really about. And that's really what this whole lecture series is about, too. It's not just explaining the book, but um, hopefully being able to, um, hopefully being able to use those ideas and apply them in the right context in our own lives so that we can have that sense of um, pervasive meaning, satisfaction, and quality, you know, not in spite of the challenges of life, um, but in the presence of them as well. So, that's what this is all about. I think that's, I've gone an hour and a half, which is way longer than I planned on going. And I hope that, you know, aside from talking about Kant and Hume, it was not too, uh, not overly, not overly boring and disconnected um, from your life. That's certainly my hope. And so let's see. Well, next time uh, they actually arrive in Bozeman, in Montana. This is when John and Sylvia will turn back in Bozeman, in Montana is also where Piercig, or rather Phaedrus, made some of the most important discoveries of his life, and we're going to run through some of the most important ideas and concepts of this book. So I'm incredibly excited for the next time. Um, so uh, once again, thank you very much, whether you're listening now or you're listening at some point in the future. Um, I've enjoyed interacting with you a little bit in the chat, and I look forward to hearing your comments below. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time.